coverage of the space shuttle launch will continue in a moment. At launch pad 39A, the voice of launch control is confirming everything is okay, but let's uh, pick up the latter part of what he has to say. ...remaining events, as well as monitoring the shuttle system's response. At T-minus seven minutes, the orbiter axis arm will be retract. At T-minus five minutes, the auxiliary power units will be started. At T-minus four minutes, a purge of the main engines will start. At T-minus two minutes and 55 seconds, liquid lock oxygen pressurization will begin. At one minute and 57 seconds, liquid hydrogen pressurization will start. And at T-minus 31 seconds, the redundant set sequencer will take over. At that point, events happen far too quickly, and readings of the systems must be done too fast for humans to perform. The redundant set sequencer is located in the orbiter and utilizes the four flight computers. It has been monitoring the work of the earthbound ground launch sequencer up to that point, but now command changes to the orbiter from the ground launch sequencer with it acting as the backup. However, it must send a go indication to the orbiter prior to the time a main engine start command is to be given at T minus 6.68 seconds Otherwise, the count will stop and be recycled to the T-minus nine-minute point. After additional recycle events, the clock will recycle to the T-minus 20-minute point. <clears throat> we have just had a discussion between our NASA launch director, George Page, and his uh, counterparts at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. He has been told there are no constraints to the launch at the present time. Just about two minutes away from picking up the count at the T minus nine minute point to the shuttle launch control. All right, two minutes away from uh, getting out of this planned 10 minute hole. The clock stopped at T minus nine. In about uh, two minutes, the clock, uh, if nothing goes wrong, will start to roll down toward launch. Now, this is the scene from just outside our CBS News broadcast center at the Kennedy Space Center. Some of the crowds that has uh, gathered here. Uh, to see the uh, launch this morning, hopefully. Uh, we're about three and a half miles from the uh, launch pad site, uh, and this crowd in the grandstand, including some uh, VIP visitors here today, uh, the grandstand covered, but there's no sign of rain in sight. Uh, the weather looks good. All the systems look good. The next thing uh, of importance that will happen uh, as we take a look at the press area and the photographers uh, outside, the next important thing that will happen here is uh, the look toward the clock to begin to roll again out of this uh, planned 10-minute hole, which is rapidly drawing to a close. The astronauts uh, in the cockpit uh, of the orbiter, they were wished good luck a few minutes ago, and we could hear Joe Engel, the 49-year-old graduate of uh, Kansas University, respond, we'll see you in about a week. And you have to know how badly he wants it to go today uh, Joe Engel, the commander, and Dick uh, Truly, the pilot, truly celebrating his 44th uh, birthday today. Uh, after that disappointment of last week getting down to within 31 seconds of a launch and then having it scrubbed, they're in there, strapped on their backs, uh, now waiting in the orbiter itself. You can see the orbiter just uh, slightly to the left of center of your screen. The main object that you see there, the largest object uh, in this uh, picture, live from the launch pad itself, is the external fuel tank. That fuel tank that uh, provides uh, in eight minutes three engines enough propellant to fill 18 backyard swimming pools release as much energy as 23 hoover dams let me say that again that that fuel tank helps this spacecraft to use uh, and release as much energy as 23 hoover dams and enough power to drive a battleship and seven nuclear subs they'll be burning uh, the uh, engines and the uh, full power well, for a total of 808 uh, minutes and 40 seconds. And here you see the engines. Now, this, these are the engines of the spacecraft itself, not to be confused with the solid rocket uh, engines that are off to the side. I really shouldn't say uh, engine. Now, here you can see down at the, on our model, these are the solid rockets to either side, which provide some of the thrust to help get the 
spacecraft off of the pad. These are the engines of the spacecraft itself, and that's what you saw the live picture of a moment ago, and perhaps uh, Bill Lynn will be able to switch back there. Now, those are the engines itself. Uh, the engines have not yet started, and also keep in mind, when we get down to launch time, hopefully about uh, 11 and a half minutes from now, don't be confused. When those engines start up, it, it doesn't jump right off the pad immediately. Be, uh, because uh, they have to have the rocket, solid rocket uh, fuel engines go also. So, but once it gets going, there is that tremendous thunder and light. The voice of launch control is up again, so let's take a listen. Just a slight delay in having the voice of uh, launch control. You see the scene from inside the launch control center here at the Kennedy Space Center. The T-9 and holding clock has not yet started to roll again. It should in a matter of seconds if no problem has developed. Now, we had an indication that the voice of uh, launch control would be speaking to us, but we have not yet heard that voice. That does not necessarily uh, indicate that any trouble has developed, but the clock has not yet started to run. We do expect to hear uh, the voice of launch control in about 10 seconds. It's critical that this clock start to roll because uh, the countdown to the launch uh, doesn't resume until this the clock does roll. Launch control, T minus nine minutes and holding. Launch director George Page asked for a slight delay in picking up the countdown at this point while he checks a couple of things which he heard during the countdown. He has just checked with the range safety officer to determine that a uh, that a dropout of the main carrier uh, wave that is used by the range safety people uh, is not serious and that a backup carrier signal uh, is satisfactory. He is also checking on several other things and we will get back to you as soon as a determination has been made to pick up the countdown. This is shuttle launch control. Heart thump time once again in uh, launch control. Uh, Leo Krupp and astronaut uh, Bonnie Dunbar, what do you make of this? It, it's said to be a slight delay and not very serious, but any time that clock doesn't resume the countdown as we expect, I always begin to think, uh-oh, perhaps here we go again with another scrub. What do you think? I, I don't think it's an orbiter problem. I think that uh, they're looking at range safety, uh, perhaps a signal carrier, uh, to make sure that they have two. I don't know that we've talked about range safety before, but one of the aspects of guaranteeing uh, safety to the crew and to uh, people in the area, should we have a problem, is uh, that we need to signal the crew is if they need to eject and if the vehicle is possibly out of control that we can destroy it. And that's what uh, range safety is really all about. So they're verifying that those carrier's signals are all correct. But Leo Krupp, I, I realize we're well ahead of ourselves in the sense that uh, there is no particularly serious problem that we know about other than the clock has not started to run, that they want to check this range control safety. But Bonnie Dunbar just said something about possibly destroying the spacecraft. It's something we don't often talk about. <laughs> but uh, under a worst case scenario, the spacecraft might have to be destroyed. But the astronauts uh, have the capability of getting out of there before that would happen, do they not? Well, there is a period from uh, liftoff to 25 seconds where there's probably not a satisfactory escape envelope. But after that, if the vehicle should deviate from its trajectory where it becomes a hazard to the local population, then the range safety, as soon as the vehicle gets out of this trajectory, the range safety will light a light in the cockpit telling the crew that they have a range safety arm situation and the vehicle is going to be detonated after a certain time period and the crew then has the option of either doing a fast separation, which means they could immediately separate the external tank and the solid rocket boosters or they could eject. Now we're told that uh, the voice of launch control will be up in about 10 seconds. Uh, right now we have a slight delay. We're T minus nine and holding. Let's listen to what launch this control has to say. launch control at T minus nine minutes and holding. Launch director George Page has checked on uh, a number of problems which had come up during the countdown to determine that there are no constraints at the present time. He has spoken to the launch crew and says, let's take our time. It's been a hard one. Watch all your data, but we're going to do it right. Uh, he has uh, spoken to the, uh, the crew, and he's, uh, to Joe Engel and to Dick Truly, and said, we're going to give you a good one. 
We're in the process now of the test conductor going over the hold criteria with the launch team to let them know what point holds can be called and what the proper procedure is to call that hold. Uh, launch director George Page has told the launch team to take their time and do it right. We're standing by now to get word of the point at which we will be picking up at the T minus nine minutes point. This is shuttle launch control. Well, the tension grows in uh, launch control as at the T minus nine and holding mark, they continue to hold. No indication of uh, how serious the problem uh, may be. Uh, they did make an effort there to uh, reassure both the astronauts, uh, everyone working in launch control, and uh, yes, those of you um, in the listening and watching audience, that uh, things continue to look overall pretty good, as was being explained earlier by uh, my helpers here, Leo Krupp and astronaut Bonnie Dunbar, that uh, the indication is that the problem has something to do with the, the range safety, that is the safety in the immediate area of launch pad uh, 39A. More about that uh, in a few moments. But uh, right now, I must say that our CBS News coverage of the launch of Space Shuttle Columbia will continue after this pause for station identification. This CBS News special report continues. Two. Here again is Dan Rather. Tension on the launch pad at uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Isn't there always tension just before a launch, but uh, special tension at this moment because the clock has stopped. T minus nine and holding. That if everything had been going exactly according to plan, that clock would already be running. It isn't running partly because of a difficulty on the safety range uh, in the immediate area of the launch pad. A voice of launch control will be up in a few seconds. Again, let's take a listen. This is shuttle launch control at T minus nine minutes and holding. Launch director George Page has just ordered that the clock will be picked up at one minute after 10 Eastern Standard Time this morning. We have just had a check of the various major managers for this morning's launch. Norm Carlson has conducted that uh, check and all of the managers have said they are ready to pick up at the proper time. The launch director, George Page, has just asked Deke Slayton, the OFT launch manager, if he is go, and Deke Slayton has said he is go for launch. We're about two minutes away from picking up the countdown at the T-minus nine-minute point, which would result in a launch at 10.10 a.m. this morning. This is shuttle launch control. Caution the byword as George Page uh, re-emphasizing what he said a few minutes ago, quote, let's take our time. It's been a hard one, let's do it right. Quote, unquote, from George Page, who's in charge of the launch. That's what he told the astronauts who were strapped into the cockpit uh, of the orbiter, waiting and uh, eager to get uh, out there, having had their flight scrubbed last week. As you heard, the indication now is, with the clock at T minus nine and holding, will be resumed, uh, the running of the clock will start again at just after 10 o'clock Eastern time, just after the hour coming up. And then the countdown will uh, resume from this uh, T minus nine point, hopefully right on down through launch. So uh, Leo Krupp and Bonnie Dunbar, uh, it doesn't look like whatever the problem was with the range safety officer, that it was uh, a very uh, serious problem in that uh, every indication is that they will resume that clock start it running about two minutes from now. I do want to say to our audience that uh, once we uh, get very close to launch time and in the post-launch period, we don't intend to say a whole lot. We intend to let the, uh, the sound and pictures speak for themselves. We do want to prepare, for, prepare you for what you will be seeing because on a good weather day like today, you should be able to see quite a lot. But first, let's listen again to launch control. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus nine minutes and holding, just 15 seconds away from picking up the clock at the T-minus nine-minute point. All of the major managers have indicated they are ready to go, and we are at T-minus nine minutes and counting. The launch sequence are now being controlled by the ground launch sequencer from now up to the T-minus 31 second point when they'll switch to the onboard redundant set launch sequencer. The ground launch sequencer is part of the launch processing system 
and operates by relaying commands to the orbiter's onboard computers, which then reports back to the launch processing system that the commands have been executed. And the clock the is The primary running. job of the computers is to check that all of the launch commit criteria are being met, such as propellant loads, temperatures, pressures, and other measurements. The Chase aircraft have been launched from Patrick Air Force Base to take part in the activities of this morning's launch. T minus eight minutes, 10 seconds, and counting. Well, good news as the clock starts out of that uh, T minus nine and holding pattern that it had been in for quite a few minutes, and the clock is now running uh, again toward a launch. Now, briefly, this is what you're going to see as we get closer down to launch time. You can see in this live picture from launch pad 39A, the orbiter on the back of the external fuel tank with the solid fuel rockets to either side uh, poised for the launch. If there is no further hold and no further hold is planned, we've been through all of the planned holds now, that if all goes well, everybody here with their fingers crossed hoping that it does, the clock will continue to roll right down to launch time. Now, these are the things to look for uh, at launch. Just at the moment, the access arm, which has been right up against the orbiter, you can see just to the left of center of your screen, you see the access arm, which is up against the orbiter, will be, be in the process of being pulled back now. That's the uh, scene from inside the access arm area. The hatch is closed. Now the access arm begins to pull away. And what you see up there is roughly what the astronauts are seeing from their cockpit. You can see how far they can see out into the distance. The access arm pulling slowly away. In case of any emergency, it could go back up to the uh, hatch and uh, help get the astronauts out. But the clock is rolling down toward launch, 637, 636. The access arm um, moved away now from the orbiter. This is uh, a high shot looking down that access arm. You can see how it, it moves to its left to go up against the orbiter, moving now to its right away from the orbiter. And now the two astronauts alone in the orbiter, the access arm pulled away from the side of their spaceship. As the clock moves down to the uh, six minute and six rolling minutes. mark. And we want to show you very briefly using our model what to look for as we get down close to launch. The orbiter itself, the two solid rocket boosters, the large external fuel tank, liquid hydrogen and oxygen. At launch, you will see the engines of the orbiter itself. They'll be cranked up. The solid rocket boosters will crank up. Once they crank up and get going, there's no turning back from that point on. Now, once launch is affected, watch, and you should be able to see it. Watch the spacecraft will turn. Shortly after launch, you should be able to see that. You also may be able to see the two solid rocket boosters fall away, leaving the orbiter and the external fuel tank going on out toward space. You should be able to see that. Uh, shortly after launch. As of the moment, we are just about five minutes away uh, from launch with the clock rolling on down, a slight uh, delay in that uh, they had hoped to get uh, the launch at, a, at or about uh, at about 10 o'clock. But uh, George Page, the launch director, said, let's take our time, let's get it right. He held at the uh, T minus nine mark for a little longer than had been anticipated, but now the clock is running down once again. Now the auxiliary power units have started in the spacecraft as the clock gets down to four and a half minutes and running. The auxiliary power units, those are the units in which uh, trouble developed last week, causing a two-day scrub, uh, oil filter and lube oil difficulties. And let's pick up the voice of, uh, and the chase planes uh, have gone up now, and this is a view of the chase planes, uh, which will be viewing uh, the launch as it goes, and also giving us some photographs of the launch itself. Let's pick up the voice of uh, launch control for a moment. T minus four minutes. We have begun nitrogen purge of the main engines on the orbiter. T minus three minutes, 50 seconds and counting. T minus three minutes, 45 seconds. 
the Elevon speed brake and rudder are being moved through a pre-programmed pattern to assure that they'll be ready to be used in flight. Little exhaust from the APUs coming out the tail of the orbiter, indicating that all is well. T-minus 3 minutes, 28 seconds and counting. The shuttle is now on internal power. However, the fuel cells are still receiving their fuels from the ground support system through the tail service mast for one more minute. T-minus 3 minutes, 15 seconds. The profile checks of the aero surfaces have been completed and checked. T you can see three they're minutes, testing the movement of the seconds. engines in there. The see the movement of the spacecraft's engines. Just a final check to make sure they will move. Control. Two minutes, 55 seconds and counting. The lock valve on the external tank has been closed and pressurization begun. After the tank is pressurized, the hold capability is limited. T minus two minutes, 40 seconds. We have cleared the caution and warning memory. The gaseous oxygen vent arm is uh, being retracted. T minus two minutes, 30 seconds and counting. The Fuel cell ground supply of oxygen and hydrogen has been terminated, and the vehicle is on its onboard supply. T minus two minutes, 15 seconds. The main engines have been gimbaled to their start position, and the pressure on the liquid oxygen tank is at flight pressure. Coming up on the two minute point. T minus two minutes and counting. The liquid nit hydrogen vent valve has been closed and flight pressurization underway. T minus one minute, 50 seconds and counting. The gaseous oxygen vent arm is almost fully retracted. T minus one minute, 40 seconds and counting. T minus one minute, 30 seconds, 90 seconds away from launch of STS-2. and counting, the liquid hydrogen tank is at flight pressure. Coming up on the one minute point in our countdown, everything going smoothly. T minus one minute and counting. T minus 50 seconds, the firing system for the ground suppression water is armed. T-minus 40 seconds, development flight instrument recorders are on. T-minus 37 seconds, we're about just a few seconds away from switching control of launch to the computer sequence. We have control of the countdown now being conducted by the launch sequencers on board the orbiter. T-minus 20 seconds and counting. The SRB hydraulic power units have started. The SRB nozzles have been moved to start position. Coming up on 10, T minus 10, 9, we have go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Minus 3, 2, 1, we have ignition. We have ignition of the solid rocket boosters and liftoff. Liftoff of America's space shuttle, and the space shuttle has cleared the tower. Houston now controlling the mission control, confirmed control maneuver starting.
one minute, 20 seconds. Columbia now nine nautical miles in altitude, six nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading 3,000 feet per second. Mark, one minute, 35 seconds. Columbia now 14 nautical miles in altitude, 10 nautical miles downrange. Columbia, Houston, uh, you can expect any BAP, CNW. One, one minute, 45 seconds, coming up on negative seats where altitude's too high for ejection seats. Negative seats. Mark, Mark, one minute, 55 seconds, Columbia now 21 nautical miles in altitude, 18 nautical miles downrange, velocity now reading 5,000 feet per second. Standing by now for solid rocket booster separation confirmation. 50 at 205. Roger, copy. BC less than 50. Confirm good Roger, solid rocket booster separation. Smooth plans, Houston. Two minutes, 25 seconds on board. Guidance is converging as program. Columbia is now steering for its precise window in space for main engine cutoff. Columbia now 35 nautical miles in altitude, 40 nautical miles downrange. The solid rocket boosters have uh, yeah, fallen away. The orbiter is riding on the back of his external fuel tank. Columbia, thank you. Mark, 2 minutes 45 seconds. Columbia now has two engine landing capability at Rota Naval Air Station, Spain. 2 minutes 54 seconds. Status check and mission control given a go for three minutes. Columbia, Houston, you're looking good at three. Roger, copy. Looking good at three. Three minutes, eight seconds. Uh, Columbia now 46 nautical miles in altitude, 66 nautical miles downrange. Columbia's three main engines continue to run smoothly. Engel and truly really moving out now. Velocity now reading 6,700 feet per second. Next critical time is when the external fuel tank, uh, they try to separate it from the orbiter itself. 30 seconds, Columbia now 52 nautical miles in altitude, 85 nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading 7,000 feet per second. Return status check in the mission control by Flight Director Neil Hutchinson. Engel and truly given a go to continue. Seconds. Columbia now 58 nautical miles in altitude, 112 nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading 7,900 feet per second. Four minutes, eight seconds. Uh, standing by for a negative return and pressed ATO call ups by Capcom Brandon Stein. Standing by for negative return. Control of the flight now has been switched over to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, and the voice you're now hearing from there is John McLeish. Control now in Houston. With that call up, Engel and Truly now committed to space travel. They can no longer turn around and return to the launch site. Four minutes, 35 seconds. Columbia now 60. Columbia, Houston, you're pressed ATO. Columbia, pressed ATO. Looking good here. Four minutes, 44 seconds. Uh, for the first time, Columbia has uh, forward abort to orbit capability on two engines by throttling engines up to 107%. Columbia now 68 nautical miles in altitude, 189 nautical miles downrange, velocity now reading 10,300 feet per second. Columbia Houston, your normal throttle. Five minutes, 14 seconds. That call up by Capcom Brandon Stein says that England truly now capable of abort to orbit on two engines without throttling up Columbia's engines. Five minutes, 25 seconds. Columbia now 68 nautical miles in altitude, 228 nautical miles downrange. about three minutes from the time when the external uh, fuel tank should drop away. Three minutes to Mark go in five minutes, moment. 40 seconds, uh, standing by for press to Miko. Columbia, Houston, you're press to Miko. press to Miko. Five minutes. Good show, Dan. This is really smooth. Five minutes, 55 seconds. The Press D'Amico call from uh, Capcom Brandon Stein says, should Columbia lose but one engine, press on, keep flying forward.
Columbia's engines have enough uh, energy to, uh, to, uh, to achieve Columbia's normal attitude. Your single engine rotor and everything's looking good. Miko being main engine cut off. There is a point when the main engines of the orbiter will cut off. Uh, Mark, six minutes, 18 that's when they get into to orbit. Capcom, that point not yet. The, the orbiter is still Columbia's riding the external fuel of tank. About two minutes Naval until the critical Spain. moment uh, when the fuel tank Mark, six will be jettisoned. Now 68 nautical miles in altitude, 346 nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading uh, 14,900 feet per second. Uh, Columbia now 67 nautical miles in altitude, 397 nautical miles downrange. Columbia pitching over now, diving to increase velocity, decrease altitude, giving Columbia her most favorable attitude. Seven minutes, five seconds. Standing by now for single engine press to Miko. Being main engine cut off, we could faintly hear the voice of the crew saying, quote, this is really smooth. Columbia Houston, your single engine press to Miko. Seven minutes, 20 seconds. Our report says that England truly can achieve uh, normal engine cutoff targets even if two engines go out. Mark, seven minutes, 30 seconds. Columbia now 64 nautical miles in altitude, 511 nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading 20,000 feet per second. Seven minutes, 43 seconds. G-force is building for England truly now, coming up to three Gs. Columbia now 63 nautical miles in altitude, 562 nautical miles downrange. Mark, eight minutes. Columbia, Houston, you're going eight. The spacecraft not yet in orbit. Uh, slowly being throttled back now. Should be throttled at 65% at six seconds before main engine cutoff. Columbia now 63 nautical miles in altitude, 645 nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading 24,000 feet per second. That liftoff with the space uh, shuttle, seconds, the first flight, uh, Young's now, pulse was Tom at 85, Bob Crippens went to 130. We'll have to wait and hear what this crew felt in the way of their pulse. Roger, we copy Columbia. Confirmed shutdown. Uh, Columbia now returned to space, not yet returned to orbit. Uh, standing by now for external tank separation. Columbia Houston, you can ignore the IMU bites. Roger Houston, we've got ET SEP. Roger on the SEP. Eight minutes, 58 seconds. Confirm external tank separation. Houston, ET SEP, good. The external Columbia tank is Army away. Copy. Columbia now performing an evasive maneuver, moving below and beyond the external tank. Mission control in Houston. Minutes, external seconds. tank has been dropped away. Going the orbiter is on its own using its own engine. Roger, Columbia, Not yet in orbit, but headed for orbit. Columbia, Houston, uh, your go for nominal ohms one and for APU shutdown on time. Okay, Dan, and we're maneuvering to air two now. Roger. 9 minutes 44 seconds, uh, Columbia now maneuvering to Ohms 1 burn attitude using the two 6,000 pound thrust engines. Ohms 1 will be posi grade, uh, moving Columbia forward and higher on her flight path, placing Columbia in orbit. When they talk about those Ohms burns, those are the engine burns necessary to put the spacecraft into orbit. This, this burn will put us Columbia in a 60 by 120 so nautical mile orbit. Uh, right we we'll have to uh, no problem. that with another burn about 45 minutes. Roger, and the VAP is shut down. Uh, we'll need it cycled off and then uh, back to the primary on. The picture you see is of mission control in Houston. The uh, spacecraft well out of sight now. Okay, we got a good OMS ignition. Headed for orbit, but not yet into orbit. They got the OMS ignition. Yeah. Roger. Ignition of the first engine necessary to burn in order to put the spacecraft into orbit. That's a critical test beyond us now. You may have heard some reference there to Capcon. That's astronaut Dan Brandenstein, the Capcon or capsule communicator, who talks directly to the crew. Seconds from LOS, uh, both Ohm's engines look good going over the hill. 
Configure LOS, we'll see you at Madrid. Okay, Dan, we'll see you there. Turn up to stay. A reference to the fact that the best, uh, the next communication point is in uh, Spain. Roger, thank you. Yes, sir. What you're seeing is animation of uh, roughly where the spacecraft is and what the astronauts themselves are into at this moment. The only thing we heard out of the crew is this is really smooth. Dan, I think I did hear him call out a couple master alarms. They were getting some uh, some IMU bites, which is a which means and the IMU was temporarily dropping out to causing a in-flight. Uh, it's a built-in test equipment. It's what it does, but. And they also seem to be having some problem with one of the evaporators, but we'll have to wait and see after they sort this out. But none of that sounds like serious trouble to you, Leo Carl? No, it's not serious, but they did have some, some master alarms on the launch. I heard them call one out. Let's Coming listen to uh, mission 10, control for just a moment. 10, 9, we have go for main engine start. We, we have main, the main engine. engines now at any moment. They're going for main engine start. One. This I is have ignition. Thing. We have ignition of the solid rocket boosters and liftoff. Liftoff of America's space shuttle, and the space shuttle has cleared the tower. Uh, what that is, uh, this is a replay of the launch itself. Both of the uh, auxiliary engines that are necessary for orbit, one of them has already started burning. What you are seeing uh, here, NASA is replaying and hearing the launch itself. And that's what confused everybody, uh, myself included, myself especially. Neil Hutchinson, you're going to go at 40 seconds. I think it's important to note, note that the IMU bite tests also include uh, internal temperature tests, and et cetera. And uh, Neil Hutchinson said to disregard it could be just a very well, for just, for just one moment there, when they said main engine start, I thought they meant, well, the main of those auxiliary engines. But now, wh where we are right now, th this is a replay. NASA's seeing a videotape replay of the launch itself, which is a beautiful uh, one thing of wonder. But where the astronauts are at this moment, they're headed for orbit, but they're not yet into orbit. They're in orbit now. They, they're, just they're in a 60 orbit. by 120 nautical mile orbit. All right, they're in a 60 by 120 nautical mile orbit. They've just reached orbit. Let's take our model of the uh, orbiter itself. They are at the moment flying, if you will, upside down or right side up, Leo Cutter? Upside down and forward. Upside down With and nose, forward. Nose pointing to the pointing direction in this direction. Going. And they're now in uh, their first orbit. If they have an emergency and have to land, their next available place to land is in Spain. No, they can no longer make Spain. They're, they've, they're they committed to orbit point. now. That's right. They're, they're in orbit, and they could come down in, in Edwards or any one of the contingency landing sites. They could pick their landing site now if they had trouble. There's no indication of any trouble anywhere. And in case uh, you have joined us late and missed the launch itself, we will, of course, be uh, re-showing uh, the launch as the evening, as the morning goes along. Uh, the astronauts, uh, every indication is that while they have a few uh, uh, minor problems uh, in the cockpit, some indication that uh, this or that backup system may not be working perfectly, everything has gone a picture perfect this morning in terms of the launch. Let's don't forget what's been accomplished here. Uh, that after last week's scrub and a two-day delay that turned into a much longer delay, the launch this morning was successful. The astronauts are now in orbit. They're making their first orbit of the Earth. Uh, let us hope that it, the whole trip turns out to be as picture-perfect as the first space shuttle back in the spring. Our CBS News coverage of the Space Shuttle Columbia will continue in a moment. pad is empty at the Kennedy Space Center. The launch was successful. The astronauts are now in orbit, their first orbit of the Earth. Everything uh, that can be seen and heard on computers, heard from the spacecraft itself, indicates uh, that all is well with the astronauts. And this, the first reusable space vehicle, is back into orbit. The Space Shuttle Columbia, and second time into outer space after this successful uh, launch this morning. And let's take another look. Let's pick up from just before the launch and watch again the launch of the Space Shuttle Columbia just about uh, 10, 10, 10, 15 10, minutes ago. Nine. We have go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Minus three, two, one. We have ignition. We have ignition of the solid rocket boosters and liftoff. Liftoff of 
America's space shuttle, and the space shuttle has cleared the tower. Houston now controlling the mission control, confirmed roll maneuver started. 20 seconds, thrust looks good. 25 seconds, roll maneuver completed. 30 seconds, Columbia now one nautical mile in altitude. 35 seconds, status check and mission controlled by Flight Director Neil Hutchinson, given a go at 40 seconds. Columbia Houston, your go at 40. Roger, go at 40, and master arm, and it's the... Uh... 48 seconds, throttling the engine down for Mexico. Roger, ignore the master alarm, Columbia. Okay, no. Coming up on period of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. Mark one minute, Columbia now five nautical miles in altitude, three nautical miles down range, velocity now reading 2,300 feet per second. One minute, eight seconds, pass through Max Q. Columbia still looking good, throttling engines back to 100%. Mark, one minute, 20 seconds, Columbia now nine nautical miles in altitude, six nautical miles down range, velocity now reading 3,000 feet per second. Mark, one minute, 35 seconds, Columbia now 14 nautical miles in altitude, 10 nautical miles down range. And Columbia, Houston, uh, you can expect an EVAP, CNW. One, one minute, 45 seconds, coming up on negative seats where altitude's too high for ejection seat. Your negative seats. Roger, negative seats. Mark, one minute, 55 seconds, Columbia now 21 nautical miles in altitude, 18 nautical miles down range, velocity now reading 5,000 feet per second. Standing by now for solid rocket booster separation confirmation. 50 at 205. Roger, copy. PC less than 50. Confirm good solid rocket booster separation. Videotape, a replay uh, of the launch. That uh, is the first full replay we've had in this broadcast. We had a partial one earlier in which uh, NASA may have gotten confused. We certainly got confused as to what was happening because uh, in the middle of uh, transmission from Mission Control in Houston, uh, up they came with their own replay of the launch, which you uh, saw in part as part of our coverage, while it took everyone a few seconds to figure out uh, what it was they were doing at Mission Control in Houston. But that was a videotape replay of the launch itself from here at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, the ground shook here. The crowd outside you, uh, broke into applause as the uh, space shuttle lifted off uh, perfectly from the launch pad, made its uh, expected turn just after launch, uh, as it had to do perfectly. The uh, external, uh, uh, the solid rocket Boosters first dropped away, then the external tank dropped away, all right on schedule. The auxiliary engines uh, burned properly, put the spaceship into orbit, and uh, the spaceship is now out there in orbit. We haven't heard uh, much from the astronauts, but what little we have heard is that they said everything was going smoothly. And so the astronauts are already at work in space, and Mort Dean and Paul Whites in Houston can bring us up to date on exactly what they're doing. Mort okay, and Paul. Dan, you said that the ground shook in Florida. The ground shook here, too, didn't it, Paul? And we're a long way from the launch pad. Well, my heart was shaking a little bit. Well, tell us, you, you went up in uh, the first manned Skylab mission. You went up for 28 days. What is the astronaut thinking and feeling at that moment when suddenly you know you're really on your way? Uh, basically... <laughs> I hate to say this because it only reinforces the uh, impression and the stated opinion that we are nothing but technicians and, uh, and engineers. But you're there to do a job and you, you want to uh, perform that function as best you can. Uh, we've been through so many simulations of it that you feel almost as though you've been there many times before. As a matter of fact, there is a, a rumor that uh, is unfounded as far as I know that people have actually, during holds on the pad, have fallen asleep. I've heard that rumor. You didn't fall asleep, though. No, I didn't. No, I was really looking forward to my first flight. Now, you're not simply being the good uh, astronaut here, saying we were just on board doing our job. Didn't the heart race or, or pound? Didn't you feel any sensation uh, as it began to lift off? Oh, yes, yes. But that, that's kind of transitory. It, it really is. Once you get through, uh, you know you're on your way. The vehicle's performing well. Everything feels good. And you kind of... Uh, lay back and you're really concerned with the task at hand, which is to get yourself and all that equipment into orbit. Paul, what kind of view did they have as they were lifting off? Of course, they were on their backs. 
There are, uh, well, about six windows, I guess, up front there. That's correct. What could they see? Just sky or? Uh, out the left side, out the commander's window on the left side, you can see the top portion of the, uh, of the tower, the launch tower there at the Cape. But, of course, that rapidly disappears from view, as uh, John Young said, and in about three seconds, you really can't see anything except what's ahead of you, which may or may not be clouds. Did you get a kick in the pants? Could you feel that lift? Could you feel the G-force? On the Saturn I, it was relatively low Gs. It, uh, we lifted off at about 1.2 Gs, 1.2 times the force of gravity. With the solid rocket boosters on, on this vehicle is that you get uh, the acceleration builds up significantly faster. Now this all means, of course, that you, Paul, and Bonnie down there in Florida are one step closer to uh, being aboard a shuttle yourselves. And we're one step closer to a successful program. For sure. And? Astronaut Paul Weitz. Walter Cronkite has joined me here at our CBS News broadcast booth at the Kennedy Space Center. Walter, we've received word that the uh, second burn is a go for the second burn. It means burn the auxiliary engines, which would uh, take it to a circular orbit of 120 by 120 uh, nautical miles or 138 by 138 statute miles. And you were saying while uh, Mort and Paul were talking that uh, this is stuff we all learned back in the Jiminy program. This is what we paid for to learn how to do this. That's right. You know, every, everything that they're doing out there has had to be tested, or most of it had to be tested uh, previously, and uh, we, that's what the space program was all about. We're now exploiting what we explored and demonstrated earlier. They have some things, of course, they're doing out there for the first time. It's the first time they're flying a used vehicle, and that's the big test right now. And I gather that they have a little problem uh, right now with that uh, oil uh, overheating in the uh, APUs, the uh, hydraulic units. Uh, well, that's the same, the same problem. Pro that, mm -hmm. Sorry. Well, no, the same problem that delayed the flight uh, for a week. Uh, don't know what it means yet or how serious it may be, but uh, that happened. Well, they, these auxiliary power units, these are the units in which they did have the trouble last week. In fact, they were the cause, uh, the main cause of the scrub last week. The auxiliary power units, the lube oil was not moving through there just right. They changed the filters, thought they had all that squared away. Uh, now the indications are that they're having some little bit of difficulty with it. Too early to say just how serious that difficulty is. I think it's just be. one of the units, I believe uh, I heard that correctly, just one of the units that is overheating a little bit. There are three right. auxiliary power there, there units. There are three units, and the, this is one of the three. So right now, not, uh, not an especially no, serious problem unless it gets worse, worse than this. I wouldn't think so. Walter, you weren't here for the uh, first space shuttle launch. This is the first time you've seen the space shuttle go up. The second time it's gone up. Mm. Was it much different? being here than, than other launches, for example, the Apollo launches to the moon? Well, I, I uh, was surprised to find that, it, that the intensity of the, uh, of the blast effect or the vibration, the noise, is much, much less than the Saturn uh, uh, that boosted our Apollo flights up. Of course, that maybe had to be uh, more powerful, for one thing, to get a, a, a mission to the moon. Uh, though it was lifting uh, less weight, it had to lift it uh, farther and higher and get it out of Earth orbit. And that takes a great deal of extra effort. Uh, but it was much noisier uh, under Saturn, vibration much greater. Uh, this one leaves a cloud of smoke, though. <laughs> if it wasn't cloudy down here at the uh, Cape when this one, before the mission, it certainly was afterwards. A huge crowd uh, covered, the, covered the sun for a while. Well, it's true that we, our audience didn't see it uh, because we were following the spacecraft as far as we possibly could. But uh, after the launch, a cloud, it looked like almost a, a miniature, miniature at atomic explosion. It somehow enveloped the launch pad, all of that cloud of smoke which wasn't there during the uh, Apollo missions. Well, based on your experience now, everything looks like it's going well with the possible exception now of that uh, cantankerous lube oil problem in the auxiliary power units. What would you think would be the next critical point uh, of this space flight? Now, we have an interesting thing tomorrow morning, if all goes well, in which they will exercise uh, that arm built in Canada. Where will the next critical point come in your judgment? Well, the critical com uh, next point comes, as, uh, I believe I'm right on this, when they open that uh, bay door, uh, which has to open in order to, uh, to uh, vent uh, the, the heat of, of the uh, vehicle. And that has to be tested uh, first, if that the door can't open, they got to get back uh, rather quickly. Uh, and that's, so that's the next critical point. Maybe we could show people that on our um, small model of the orbiter here. Some have seen this before, but uh, the bay doors, as Walter pointed out, do have to open in order to let uh, heat get out. If those bay doors 
get stuck for any reason and they can't be opened in this fashion, then the uh, spacecraft, uh, the orbiter would have to return to Earth. That is not expected, of course. They, the bay doors worked perfectly on the first mission in the spring. Inside here in our model, you see that arm, and we'll be covering live tomorrow morning when uh, they exercise this arm. This is the arm that will be used to repair and even build uh, space stations. Here with satellites, it has uh, the end mechanism which al allows uh, future astronauts on future flights to do many, many things with the, uh, with the orbiter. The next critical point, the opening of those bay doors, which we do expect to happen. The only uh, sign of any difficulty continues to be uh, some indication of lube oil problems in one of the auxiliary power units. You might mention, Dan, that comes an hour and 20 minutes into the flight, so it uh, bring us around uh, 11.45 when they try the bay doors. And that's a, they, I imagine they put that time, they'll confirm it, to put that time at that point, because uh, if the bay doors don't open, they're in a position then to uh, go right into Edwards. Everything looks just right on the spacecraft. They're on their way. Astronauts Joe Engel and Dick Truly on their first venture into orbit. Aboard Space Shuttle Columbia, making her second. This mission, five days, four hours, 10 minutes long, will be flown in circular orbit. 83 of them, 158 miles above the Earth. If all goes as planned, the astronauts will bring Columbia down in the 84th orbit to a landing on a dry lake bed at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And we'll have more, including the first pictures from space of this flight on the CBS Evening News tonight. Until then, for Walter Cronkite, Leo Krupp, Bonnie Dunbar and our whole crew, Dan Rather at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This has been a CBS News special report. Two.